Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am Andrei Silchuk, head of R&D Center in the Eat Art and Delivery Manager. I am really happy to welcome all of you, our fantastic viewers, to the panel discussion about AI tools, about their present and their future. This is one of the sessions that we are going to publish during the next few days as a part of IT non-stop by data, so stay tuned. By, but first things first, let me start with a short introduction about our speakers today. Actually, we have three of them, and all of them are very experienced and great professionals in their company. So today we have Jody from JetBrains, Andy from Microsoft, and Dima, my colleague from DataNet. Can I ask all of you guys to share some short background and short introduction about yourself? So maybe we can start with Jody. Jody, what do you think about this? Sure. Um, so I'm currently working as the developer advocate in data science at JetBrains. So I've been working as a data scientist for about eight years now. And prior to that, I have an academic background, big surprise. So I did my PhD in psychology and I did my postdoc in biostatistics. So this is my background. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Indy, what's about you? Can you be the next one? Yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is Andy Huang, Solution Architect at Microsoft. I'm part of the America's GPS organization, so we primarily work with our partners. I do focus and specialize in DevOps or developer velocity, so that includes many tools such as uh, GitHub Copilot. And prior to that, I've had many years of experience uh, running and also building my own team uh, in the DevOps space. Okay, great. Uh, I feel like I'm the less experienced person here already. Uh, so, Dima, please uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Make me finally show in this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. So, my name is Dmitry. I, I started a career as a software engineer, and the last three years I'm working in EML, and I'm working as a technical director of EML here in DataArt, uh, responsible for uh, different partnerships uh, for developer uh, AI tools, for uh, building POCs and uh, AI platforms for our clients, and uh, happy to be here and share our experience. Great. Thank you so much. So let's start uh, maybe about like a present uh, state and status of the AI dev tools. So I know that custom paid tools uh, have been uh, on the market for a very long time. Actually, I even remember using such tools in uh, JetBrains IDEs when I was a student. So what revolution has happened on the past year or maybe year and a half that everyone is think right now that AI dev tools is the future of dev tools overall. So I don't know, maybe Andy, maybe you can comment this. Yeah, uh, I think the big shift that we saw in the last you know year, year and a half is how much they're able to assist you now. So before, you know, I think of IDE code completion. You know, you, you're starting to write out your code, and it kind of helps you out with little little sections. Now, things like GitHub Copilot are able to help you out by writing out full functions, or even help you out in, in those contexts. It's also able to grab more information now. So before it's kind of focused on maybe a few lines, but now it's focused on the entire file, maybe other files that are opened. So that's kind of the, the big difference that we're seeing these days. Uh, okay, cool. But what is, what, what's about the speed of development? Uh, is it uh, really good to have such tools to speed up the process? Jody, what do you think about this? Yeah, so kind of going off what Andy said, it's... It's not just about, I guess, the code itself. Um, there are, like, what we're using under the hood are these large language models, which are really good at doing a broad range of natural language tasks. So it's not just about the speed of development. It's also about other parts of the developer workflow. Like, with our new AI assistant that we have coming out at JetBrains, you can also do things like explaining commit messages. So it helps with developer communication. You can do things like help with writing documentation, which helps, again, with communication. But it also takes, I guess, boilerplate tasks that can be maybe boring or slow down development and helps speed them up a lot by giving you a template to work with. Uh, can you please share some examples? Like what, what are those uh, boring tasks uh, that can be uh, speed up? So what kind of task can it speed up? Yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned like uh, this, those AI tools can help us with some boring tasks. What are actually those boring tasks? 
Yeah. So something that I've heard people talk about, about a lot is being able to prototype things. So say you need, I don't know, a bash script to insert data into a database. You don't want to look up how to do that because it's not really part of your core job. You can get the large language model or the AI assistant to write that code for you. Um, another kind of example is, let's say you're trying to understand what a colleague has done as part of a pull request. And you have to go through and compare the diff because they haven't explained very well what they've done as part of their commit message. With these AI assistant tools, um, one of the implement we've done at JetBrains is with one click, you can have that explained in natural language. So this is, I think, actually quite revolutionary because instead of having to spend a lot of time maybe looking up something you don't do very often or going through and trying to understand others' work, you can have that assisted by these AI coding tools. Wow, wow, that uh, sounds great, really. Dima, uh, what do you think uh, about this? Do you agree with those benefits that can be provided by AI tools? Yeah, I, I think that uh, there is still a big way of uh, adoption of these tools. So people need to start uh, understanding how to use that, what is prompt engineering, how to query your code, uh, how to chat with your code. Uh, for me, for instance, uh, it, it is like a, a way how to write boilerplate code like scripting on Python. Uh, what if we upload the data set and we automatically have to generate it a uh, baseline model for that? You know, these type of things are really uh, good actions which are done by AI, but still I think there is a huge like path to adoption in, in our daily developer tasks uh, going uh, forward to multiple files, multiple projects, cross-repository on CI-CD level. So there is a still big potential and I think that the, the huge value we will we'll get as soon as we automate the bigger chunk of work, not only in one file generation, but one service generation or one product generation. So the, the AIs which can generate the, the website, the landing page, I think that that's, that's what we will uh, see in the nearest future, but not ex expanding only one single project, but building the products by itself. I think that that's the way to go. And for now, uh, I still see that um, interfaces like chat, GPT, like chat interfaces are still maybe more adaptable than, than uh, the CI companions in EDs. And uh, it still needs some culture and uh, a way for, to explain people why it's important to start with that. So that's my take on that. Okay, okay, but uh, in case I don't want to chat with such a tools, uh, but I need some answers, I still can use Stack Overflow. Can you please, please help me to understand why me, for example, as a developer, should use AI tools instead of Stack Overflow? Uh, I don't know, maybe we can start with Jody. Yeah, so there's a couple of reasons. So Andy mentioned the context and uh, Copilot, as with our AI assistant, takes a lot of the context that you're working with and can actually incorporate that into the answer that the large language model can give you. So instead of, I don't know, you needing to think of all this information that might be relevant to what's going wrong with your code or the code that you want to write, take care of that and take that into consideration for you. Um, what I will say, though, is there are times where maybe something like Stack Overflow or going straight to documentation might be more appropriate. Because at the moment, the problem with large language models, if you just use them directly without um, use of agents, which we can talk about later, the problem is, is that their knowledge base is locked at the time that they were trained. And say you want to work with a problem in a very, very recent framework probably the large language model is not going to be able to help you. So in that case, going straight to the documentation or Stack Overflow is going to be probably more helpful. Okay. Okay, I see. I see. Thank you for your point. Andy, I, uh, I'm thinking that you mostly agree with uh, Jody. Maybe you have any uh, ideas uh, to share about the Stack Overflow as well? Yeah, I, I completely agree with Jody on, on the points you made. Right. Um, uh, if there's recent uh, APIs created within, you know, maybe the last couple of months, 
these AI tools will not have that training data right then and there. So, so that's a that's a great point there, Jody. Uh, another point that I like to point out of why you might want to leverage these AI tools is staying in the flow. I I find that context switching is very expensive, going from the IDE to a browser to another tool, whatever it might be, uh, can be taxing. Whereas being able to stay within the IDE because uh, these tools are built into it, you can kind of stay in that focused state. So that's another advantage of of leveraging these AI tools over just you know searching on Stack Overflow. Okay, okay. Thank you for your point. And Dima, do you agree with those statements? So you're against and you want to use Stack Overflow still? Uh, you, you know, I, I st- first of all, Stack Overflow has their own AI engine today. So they, they are going there as well. And they are using that, as far as I remember, for search and smart search across their tickets. So there are still potential for building like Gen AI applications on Stack Overflow as well. Mm. So I think it's maybe a set of tools which boost productivity for specific people. And if you move to the level of requirements generation, so there, there are no specific tools we can generate requirements for you, like user stories. But mm. still, there are models which are capable of doing that. So it's not usually always about the code itself. It's also about infrastructure and the components around that, how the team works. So I think that that's what's important as well not only the coding part. Oh, actually, you mentioned a very interesting story because I'm, as a QA in my uh, previous years, I'm really interested in the topic about user stories, acceptance criteria, so even maybe manual tests that can be created through AI tools uh, based, I don't know, on SOW or something like this. Uh, guys, do we have something like this right now? Can we generate manual tests, for example, based on some document, documents that I can share with AI tool? Mm-hmm. Andy, do you have such ideas? Uh, for manual tests, it's it can give you ideas. So via the, the chat feature, you can you can ask it, hey, you know, what are some ideas of, you know, how I'd be able to test this manually? It it doesn't have, it'll have the context, of course, of the, the file that you're trying to test. So it can kind of help you generate some ideas from there. But since we're talking about manual testing, it'll give you some ideas to kind of start the juices flowing, right? Just start to give you some ideas of what you, what is possible and what it might recommend. Uh, it can, of course, help you with automated testing mm. and from there it can kind of scaffold out some like unit tests and things like that based on what it sees so far okay cool cool uh so uh, based on everything that we discussed i want to find out a little bit more about your own products like the github copilot uh, from microsoft and uh, jbrain ai assistant from jetbrain how it's uh, how it sounds so let's start with this so eddie can you please continue and share just a couple of words in a couple of next minutes about your product what it can do what it can't do and so on yeah so GitHub Copilot, well, we've been talking about AI assistant. That's that's the primary goal. But to take it a step further, I, I like to think of it as how do we accelerate developer velocity? How do we make the jobs of the developers easier? And so that's the primary goal of, of these copilot set of tools. So, you know, GitHub Copilot can help you by taking context from your comments, not just your code. It can get that from information from other code files that are opened, uh, from, of course, the file that's open in front of it. And it can then provide suggestions based on what it thinks you're trying to do. And this might be the boilerplate code that Jody mentioned earlier, you know, trying to help you out with mundane tasks. Uh, Maybe you'll notice some patterns. Maybe you're calling REST APIs. And when you call REST APIs, you have a pattern of putting them in a try-catch block. You have some error handling in there that it notices that you're constantly sending logs to some central logging system. Once it starts noticing those patterns, it'll start replicating it. The next call you make, it'll you know, scaffold out a lot of those pieces out. And then you can start chatting with it as well, trying to figure out helping with documentation, understanding code, writing unit tests, things like, things like that. But I always like to preface at the end, it is called Copilot. You are You as a developer is still the pilot. You need to provide the proper context, uh, the direction, and you don't have to accept everything either. So these are just suggestions and you can kind of see how they can help you in certain ways and tailor your responses as, as such. 
Okay, okay, I see. And what is the audience? Is it more senior guys or uh, junior? Uh, both. So it, okay. it, can, it can help them in many different ways. So maybe a junior developer, they might take these suggestions as, oh, I didn't think about doing it that way. Let me do some more research about this different approach. Uh, a senior developer might already understand and know what direction they were thinking about going. And so they might leverage that, um, that boilerplate code you know, automation a little bit more heavily there. And then on top of that, to add, I know we talk about developers, but this can help operations teams too. So we can help with scripting languages. And I even use it for XML. I don't like writing XML. And it can help me in those scenarios whenever I'm using it. So uh, I like to broaden the idea. It's not just developers, but other folks leveraging other languages. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Uh, Joey, what about the AI system from JetBrains? Can you please also share a couple of words about it? Yeah, so um, kind of going uh, off the back of what Andy said, Again, we quite deliberately called it AI Assistant because it's designed to be a companion to you, um, something to help you be more productive, but definitely not to replace um, developer functionality. And we'll probably talk about this a little bit later, but it's because large language models do have limitations like hallucinating, and they do need to be checked by someone manually. So AI Assistant for us, it's something that we see as an extension of the productivity tools we've been doing for 20 years or so. Um, it is very deeply integrated into the IDE. And it's something we saw as a bit of an opportunity because we already collect a lot of information when we're index indexing projects in order to do a lot of the code completion and other productivity enhancements we already have built in. So it collects information like the current file you're working on. It also collects the programming language environment information, such as the dependencies you have installed, structure of the project file, um, and you can also opt in to have it to collect recent behavior. And then under the hood, what we're doing is building prompts based on this information and a couple of simpler machine learning models that are embedded within the IDE to predict what's most relevant for that particular context to go into the prompt. So then what happens is what you have sent to these large language models is very, very customized for the specific problem that you're working on. And um, because we're using like very general large language models, um, we're working with third party providers to use some of the, the newest models that have come out. Um, we've been able to do a lot of natural language work as well as just code completion. So, you know, like I've talked about, you can have it explain commit messages. You can also have it explain what code is doing. You can have refactoring suggested and have it explain why that's better. Get it to create some documentation like doc strings within Python functions um, and suggest things like renaming. So the idea is that it's really built into the developer workflow and it's this very organic part of how the developer's working rather than being you know, we talked about this before, it doesn't take you out of the, the flow or the context of what you're doing. Okay, cool. So uh, I have actually on my project uh, one very experienced developer who hates to write any documentation <laughs> at all. And this is really difficult task to uh, make him write those documents. So mm -hmm. talking about our developers, Dima, maybe you can help me to understand how we actually uh, use those tools right now in our projects in the data art? Yeah, uh, actually, it's a good question. And uh, I, I think there are two parts of it and two, two answers. So first of all, we assess the different projects and products on the market and like GitHub Copilot is one of them. And uh, it posts very specific uh, parts of productivity as we spoke before. And we are researching that. We are also always on the cutting edge. Uh, we are trying to assess different uh, products, as I said, we are uh, searching for open source models for code completion as well, the opportunities for fine tuning. This is like a part for coding. So we are exploring the opportunities. I cannot say that we are, you know, like far away into that, but there, there are a uh, great potential which we see right now uh, in, in these projects. So people uh, want to use that and like to use that. And I think the other interesting part is 
what can we do except the coding? So uh, the, the things about user stories generation, it's, it was actually a real project where we used the AI technology to transcribe the SQL codes, old legacy SQL, 30-year-old code to acceptance criteria for building the new system. And then we could describe it as well for the developers and even migrate it to, to the modern technology stack. So that's what I uh, right now see it is not uh, like yet covered by any tool because it's very customized. It depends on your old legacy technology it depends on what you want to do, how you fast you want to migrate, and to which quality you can automate that. And, and that's another uh, big point where we see the applicability of AI technologies. It's still development, but it's another part of the team. And this uh, project gave the 40% productivity boost, which we measured by ours. And this is like a real time saving on the scale of a uh, number of people working there. So my next question um, is a little bit uh, probably not very technical, but because I want to find out uh, non-technical details, like, uh, you know, for, for a person that is not very technical, like for me, can you please explain? As I understand right now, we have only code complete tools. Why it is not uh, execute complete tools, let's say? Uh, uh, Jody, what can you say about this? Can I execute some code, compile it, I don't know, merge and so on, using AI assistant uh, by, by JetBrains? I really like this question. Um, so, no. <laughs> and there are some important reasons for that. Um, so, at this point in time, I talked a little bit about hallucinations earlier. Large language models do not produce reliable code. So, this means that potentially you don't know that you're going to get exactly what you asked for. And in addition to that, you are responsible for the code that you put into production. So this means that you are responsible for double checking that everything that has been created is something that you're happy to take ownership of. So in addition to that, generating code or generating any part of a build system and compiling it and deploying it automatically can potentially lead to some really dangerous side effects so right now, in terms of automatic execution of code, it's really only done in extremely limited contexts. So for example, in example um, this company called Hugging Face, they have um, you know, a lot of open source tooling around large language models and other generative AI. And they have the ability to use agents. I've mentioned them earlier. So these are basically kind of plugins or additions that the large language model can use. And some of these agents require the use of execution of code, but even in those cases, the Python environment that that code has access to is so, so limited because it's it's really like risky to just start automatically executing code that you have no idea what the side effects could be, you have no idea what you're giving it access to. The additional problem is there is a new type of security threat coming out called prompt injection, which is where people can hijack um, large language models and actually get them to do things that you might want not want them to do. So if you're giving large language models access to, I don't know, databases or um, banking information, anything that your system might need access to in order to run automatically, you have a risk that that could get hijacked and you might dump all of your customer data out into someone's hands that may be a malicious player. Okay, here, here is uh, the place for a joke, like providing execution rights to DevTools, we can uh, create a Skynet probably uh, that can destroy all of us in future. Uh, Andy, um, I don't know, maybe Copilot can do this. Uh, can we uh, execute some code using Copilot? Uh, it's, the, it's a very similar case as what, what Jody shared. Uh, it, it, you know, similar to what we mentioned earlier, whether it's the assistant or the co-pilot, you are still the one um, in, in, the, in the driver's seat. So you have to review what's going on. And it's, it doesn't have the idea of execution or code complete. So for example, I've even done some examples where I'm writing something in .NET, and then I write a comment and I tell it, hey, write something in Python. It, it gives me that suggestion because that's what I told it to. But that, that's not going to run. 
you're not going to have two languages in the same file execute all of a sudden. So that, that's, an, that's, a, that's an example. And Jody also provided some as well, where it's creating these suggestions. You still need to review them, make sure, make sure everything is, is okay there, and it's not going to be automatically executed. Okay, okay, I see. Uh, Dima, can you please help me? Uh, can I do some execution using ChatGPT right now? Yes, yes, that's that's what we all probably know. So ChatGPT Plus have this option to execute Python code. So it's also quite limited to some extent. It has some very specific pre-installed libraries where you can, for instance, upload your data and build the plots out of it or describe this data. So this mm -hmm. is kind of available and it's a, it's a great tool uh, where you can do it. And uh, probably it will be extended in future in some way. But for now, it's a good acceleration for data analysts and uh, to the projects we did in the past, for instance, it was uh, text to data so-called projects where we chatted with the database as to what Jody uh, mentioned before. So the SQL code was generated and then was executed on the database and you get, could have the option to chat the database. But again, running these tools in production, it's, it may be quite tricky because if someone will write drop database, uh, you know, probably something may go wrong. Another idea I want to share that uh, large language models assessing another large language models, it's an interesting case as well. So this is towards the agents mostly, but there are uh, projects in open source where uh, people were uh, putting one model in a different roles and places. And for instance, I want to create a new product, give me the idea. And then it goes all the way from product designer, from uh, you know UI UX, explaining different stuff. And then you can go with, uh, treat me as a user of this product, which we just thinking about creation and interview me as a user. So we can you know put different masks within the same interface. And this is very important because again, maybe in future, a hypothetical future, we can generate the code, assess with security fine-tuned model, and then execute with another piece of software. And then it would be like safe and we'll all be sure that it's doing what it needs to do. But again, it's just a concept right now. It's not yet working like that. Okay, so this is a question from future, but uh, will we have in future engineers like not a developer on .NET, not a developer, Java developer, etc. Will we have just Chrome engineers, let's say? What do you think about this? Jody, maybe you? I, I don't think so. And okay, so I've been talking a lot about the role of I guess, AI assistance, but also large language models in development this year. And something I say time and time again is that if you think your job as a developer is to write code, you haven't understood what your job is. So there are many, many aspects to the job of software development that go beyond code creation. So one is architecture. Architecture decisions are very subjective, like a really basic one. Do you go with microservices or a monolith? That, that has no clear answer. And then beyond that, uh, Dima has been talking about business requirements. The business requirements, the tools can help us with them, but they still require a lot of, I guess, what you would call soft skills that really require, I think, a lot of nuance and human understanding in order to translate into effective applications that solve business problems. So, yes, I think that the job is going to change in the sense that maybe juniors can onboard more quickly in terms of the basics, but isn't that just an extension of what productivity tools have been doing for like 30 years? Like just helping the learning curve be faster and help you get to the more senior level considerations of the job that require a lot more nuance and focus on the business context and communication. Well, uh, I'll cut out this part uh, about who is the developer, uh, like actual developer, and I'll show this to all my developers on my projects. <laughs> so it was it was really fantastic. Thank you so oh, much for those you. words because I can put my uh, signature under each of it. So thank you so much. No uh, problem. Okay, yeah, coming back to more practical uh, area. So. As I understand, Copilot is a plugin for different IDEs. Is it right, Andy? Yeah, that's that's correct. It, it can support uh, four different IDEs right now: VS Code, Visual Studio, uh, JetBrains, and NeoVim. So it does support multiple IDEs, as you mentioned. 
Uh, okay, okay. And in this case, I have a pretty logical question. Why does JetBrain need its own AI system in case uh, we have uh, Copilot as a plugin to different ideas? Yeah, this is a very natural question, and it's actually something we've been getting a lot. Um, so first I want to say the feedback we get on the integration between Copilot and the JetBrains IDEs has been great. So I kind of want to thank um, Andy and Microsoft and the GitHub team for all their help in um, putting together such a great plugin. Um, I would say at the moment they're kind of focusing on slightly different things. So Copilot is very, very focused on code completion, and it does it extremely well because the model underlying it is designed to do that. Our AI assistant is maybe more focused on like more natural language uh, parts of the coding workflow. So doing things like I've said, like generating documentation, for example, this is something that goes a bit beyond code, cre uh, code creation, sorry. Um, things like the chat. Um, it's basically, if you're using Copilot within JetBrains tools, you won't have access to that chat. So you can have basically a conversation with this chat and have it explain things like what your code is doing, have it explain why certain refactorings are going to be effective. Um, and we also have the ability to allow you to build up a library of custom prompts. So you can basically think about the things that you want to do in your workflow and automate them and create a library that's going to allow you to do that. Wow, wow. It looks like we can have all the tools for everyday tasks, for e every task that we can imagine uh, mm -hmm. during our development routine life, let's say. Dima, in this case, I have... A also logical question why we still have so many old-fashioned let's say developers who do not use these instruments because for me right now from what i heard th they are fantastic well I, I don't think i can reply to question why uh, because it's it's you know it doesn't have the right answer uh, probably it's better to ask uh, the those people who do not use that i still think we have to find the feature for everyone and uh, People have a lot of use cases using AI right now. Document generation, text generation, email generation. I still think there is a potential in, in the coding. And uh, again, maybe people who are writing Java 6 do not get the full potential of Java 21 with GitHub Copilot. And they are not there yet. And uh, again, maybe uh, for them, uh, their knowledge base and their you know, copy pasting of the tools which their colleague did is more uh, stable than using GitHub Copilot. So we, we, we need to improve these tools. We need to move forward. We need to gain more adoption, more use cases, and then uh, it should become as a standard tool uh, just in any ED. That's, that's what I think. So maybe it will not automate everything end to end, but giving 30, 40, 50% boost, mm. that's for sure in very specific like set tasks. Well, okay, okay, let's, I hope that we will have it. Uh, okay, uh, before we are going to talk about future, I want to ask you about challenges and risks that we have right now with those tools. For example, what's about the quality of generated code? Andy, do you have some researches, investigations about the quality of the code that can be generated by Copilot? Yeah, that's a great question. I know that the GitHub team has uh, done some research in that space. And they found that, you know, the in terms of security, uh, you know, those the code generated or the code suggested by Copilot is around or better than those developers that are, you know, normally um, uh, writing the code themselves. Now, that doesn't mean that we can ignore the rest of like security or you know DevSecOps practices. We should still absolutely include. Um, uh, code scanning tools, um, you know, uh, you know, dependency checks, uh, secret scanning, all these other features should still, all these other scenarios should still be covered and we should still treat everything as such. So we don't want to just think, oh, Copilot's corn or even the, I'm assuming the AI assistant is not writing perfect code and you can just take it as it is. Uh, okay, okay. Let's imagine that uh, I'm really afraid of... Uh, the case when my code that uh, was put into those AI tools uh, to 
completion to, uh, I don't know, for some new ideas and so on, will be used for training of those AI tools and will be used like in another project by another person, like a suggested suggested part of the code. What can you say about this? Is it a really uh, good, scary or not? Uh, Jody, yeah. can, can you help me to understand if uh, your AI tool can be trained by the code that I put into it? This is a really, really important question. I'm actually really glad you brought it up. So we don't use any of the data that we collect for training. Um, we do use third-party large language models for our AI service, but we have a very strict agreement with them that any data that we pass to them can only be used for moderation. Um, and we also don't track or store any of the code, and we're got, not going to work with any third-party providers that do so. Um, and then in terms of security, this is also a great question because we're talking about something that is somewhat automated. Um, we do have security and anti-fraud checks that have been built into our AI service. So before code is passed to third-party providers, we analyze patterns of behavior just to ensure that requests that are being sent are actually originating from within the IDE and that they're behaving in such a way that, you know, it reflects an individual user trying to actually use this manually rather than some sort of um, hijacking automated system. Okay, cool. Great to hear because I was really afraid about this, you know, compliance issues and legal issues and so on. It can yes. be a big problem for us. Uh, okay, my next question also about security. Um, you know, each day uh, in different languages, we can uh, find some vul vulnerabilities. Like, I don't know, each day we have from our compliance team, please don't update to this version or update to this version and so on. What's mm -hmm. about this? Do you add such checks into AI tools? Andy, what's about you? So there are improvements that are always happening, especially in, you know for for, the, for these tools. I, I know for sure Copilot has been improving these areas. So in terms of security, they are filtering filters into the AI system to filter as much as possible vulnerabilities that may be suggested to the user. Again, just like I mentioned earlier, not everything will be covered. Um, but mm. we do pr continuously try to improve those areas. Okay, great, great, thank you. Uh, Dima, do we have any additional checks uh, in case the code was generated, let's say, and after this, do we have any additional algorithm checks and so on to be sure that uh, we can go and use this code? Like we can say, yeah, we can add this code to the production. What? Yeah, I, I think there are great third-party companies which are doing static code analysis, maybe even with the AI, which can, uh, which do know the treats and can have some recommendations based on these treats. It's more to me to the CI CD stage, probably right. when, and GitHub as well, they have their own uh, like autonomous scripts, which uh, calculate the and um, see the model versions, uh, the the libraries versions and vulnerabilities which are found there, and they suggest proactively to migrate. So it it falls, I think, both for the code and for the dependencies, and that's that's something which is working, I think, for some time already. And again, it's not on the execution time; it's when you commit your code or after you generated that. So. I, I don't think there is something right now which can check, except another a large language model, which can uh, help to understand the vulnerabilities and the generation moment. Okay, okay. Um, okay, let's move forward and let's talk a little bit about the future of AI DevTools. So let's imagine that Jody and Andy, you are the providers of such tools actually, and uh, can you please help me to understand uh, your ideas about future features, future, I don't know, functions, future uh, tools and so on that will be available in different IDEs? So, Jody, maybe we can start with you. What can you say about it? Yeah, we actually have a roadmap of features that we're currently working on or planning for the AI assistant. So one of them is actually translation between one language and another. Um, so this is currently underway. Um, something else that potentially the team is going to consider is, like I said, looking at the use of agents to expand sort of the, the knowledge base and the actual kind of how up to date 
the results can be from particular queries. So let's say um, let's say for newer libraries and frameworks, large language models tend to be quite weak. Um, there's a particular Python package called Polars, which is a very new data frame library. And I've definitely been playing around with our AI system a bit and seeing how well it goes with Polars code. It doesn't do so well. So being able to give those large language models access to much more current documentation is going to improve the code quality a lot. Uh, okay, you mentioned that um, one of the next possible features will be translation from what uh, one language to another. Are we talking about development languages here? Yeah? Exactly, yeah, I know. I was wow. really confused when they wrote that on the roadmap. I was like, are you going to do it between German and English? And they're like, no, 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 like between like Python and Java. So, well, yeah, it, nice. it's something that's currently underway. Um, we'll sort of see when that comes out, but definitely it's currently in progress. Yeah, this is really interesting. Thank you. Uh, Andy, what's about uh, features from Copilot side? Uh, can you share some ideas what will be implemented in the nearest future? Yeah, and so GitHub does share these ideas uh, on, on githubnext.com. So it, it's, a, it's a location to kind of share some ideas. GitHub Copilot actually came from there as well. But a few that come to mind, uh, one is Copilot for pull requests. So that's an area where, hey, when you're creating that pull request, it can help you with um, writing the description for it. It kind of helps speed up that pull request process so that it can generate that information. And for the next developer who is doing the review, can actually ingest that information quite quickly. Uh, another one that is on um, the roadmap is, uh, or, or at, on GitHub Next more specifically, is a Copilot for your code base, which is something that I'm really excited and waiting for. And, and that is, you know, these, these models have been trained on public. Uh, code bases. And naturally, you have your own private code bases, probably private modules private uh, and uh, methodologies and, and um, architecture that you might have created internally that is your proprietary code. And we want to have a way for you to train against that so that in the future, when you're writing, when your developers are writing code and Copilot is making suggestions, it can make suggestions based on what is proprietary within your within your scope. So that is another one that uh, I'm excited for to hopefully hear more about. Well, it will be like not general copilot, but your own copilot. Wow, yeah. that's interesting, sounds interesting demo. We have a, a unique opportunity to provide our feedback about those features. What do you think? What can be really useful? What should be postponed? Any thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think we definitely uh, need to try all of that. And uh, the feature I'm waiting uh, forward, it's uh, the generation of the whole like project. And that's, I think, the level when we don't care about the codes very much, when we can, you know, generate the landing page, as I told, or generate the e-commerce website or update the e-commerce website, see these dependencies uh, inside the codes and Actually, that's the level when we will be there. We don't care, actually, it's Python or Java, uh, and we can try to update it with the, the language itself. So it's maybe more, you know, future uh, dream, but still, uh, I, st I still think there is a potential for such tools. Uh, and that's what personally, uh, like, encourages me, uh, you know, when, when we'll be able to move it to the next level or, like, the next no-code level, uh, that, that would be really interesting. But... Uh, language transformation and uh, fine tuning on on your base. It's it's really interesting features which mm -hmm. uh, definitely need to check out and see what are the use cases for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And what do you think about the next area of uh, AI tools? Which one it will be? Like I don't know, DevOps, QA, maybe BA, or some someone else. Uh, I don't know, Jody. Jody, what do you think about this? Do you have any plans to implement new tools in some other areas? <laughs> yeah, we don't have anything planned so far. So it's because you know AI system for us is is quite new. Um, and what we're focusing on right now is really refining the AI service and making sure that we're getting the best value out of the models. That we really have everything nailed down in terms of effective inference. Um, and experimenting with different models for different use cases. So internally, we're just really trying to get the, you know, the developer productivity side of things nailed down. 
I can give you my personal opinion, which is very non jet brain. Not, I'm not representing jet brains <laughs> with this opinion, um, but I see a huge potential for these tools in terms of greater communication. So we've already talked about user stories and things like this, but given the really impressive capabilities of these models in terms of interpreting code into natural language, they potentially could be used as a, um, let me say, basis for creating more extensive documentation and keeping that up to date. So this is not planned by JetBrains. I really want to emphasize that. But this is, I think, an area where there's a lot of potential for this um, sort of tools. Okay, cool. Uh, Andy, do you agree with this point of view? Uh, with her with her point of view recently, not uh, separating from JetBrains? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, about this one. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I, I think that makes sense. And I will clarify, I, I don't have any insights from Microsoft or GitHub from that point of view, but it, it does it does make sense, right? Where the these models have been shown to be very powerful in ingesting and synthesizing large amounts of data very, very quickly. Uh, so I, I can definitely see that helping the development velocity lifecycle. Okay, and can I... Uh make a personal uh, request. Being a QA for so many times, can you please help us to do something with QA? QA are also IT engineers. We want to have some own AI too. So please, if you can, uh, put it in, into the roadmap for future. Uh, okay, and uh, coming back to the developers. So in case we have such good tools that can help during everyday life for our developers using different languages, different approaches, and so on, how do you think the requirements for the developers will change in nearest future? Uh, for example, we have right now yeah, requirements to know the algorithm, to know the language, to know, I don't know, different methodologies and so on. What do you think about the requirements for future positions for, for the developer? What, what, what changes will we have? Dima, what do you think about it? Yeah, I, I still think that basic skills are very important. The foundational skills for how to write the code, well, how the internet works, what is HTTPS. I think that that's really important things to have. And probably the same tools can help with uh, the learning as well, with the education. So there's the same way how you can boost your productivity in development, you can boost the learning productivity as well. And you can be much more confident in how you try your codes, how you play with the codes, like how to make it more optimal. So basically some things like AI coach may be available there. Right. So I think that overall learning level will increase. And that doesn't mean we uh, don't want to you know, uh, make the developers more less advanced, let's put it like that. Mm -hmm. But still, we want to have them on really good level, knowing how to use these tools, how to boost their productivity. And uh, I think that's the, that's the future. So the combination of learning productivity and the developer productivity. And uh, I think the impact would be, uh, we'll have much more tools, which we'll need to learn to be on the competitive level. But overall, the, the main approaches for development will remain the same. And if I may share the, the answer to the previous question, another idea from my standpoint, I really struggle with architecture diagrams. So if you if someone can create a tool which will generate the architecture <laughs> diagram, I think that would be the best. That's the productivity for architects which we are looking for. Uh, because like searching for the diagrams, it's not the way how we do, but uh, generate some draft where you can move the components that's mm -hmm. not where we are yet but it's really also productivity too i think uh, jody andy you have already two requests uh, for your company <laughs> so please yeah. please help us we really need it uh, <laughs> okay can i uh, rephrase the last question so uh, in, in case of uh, developer, developer interview, will we have a question during the interview? Do you have experience working with, I don't know, Copilot or any other AI tools? What do you think? Will we have it in the future? Like a mandatory point. Mm -hmm. This is a good question. I suppose you wouldn't really have an interview question about tooling generally at the level of, say, an IDE. So I would find it unusual 
to have an interview question where someone asks you if you have experience with, say, IntelliJ. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure if I have an answer for this, um, but I guess in my mind, it depends how difficult we find prompt engineering itself. Because as Andy's talked about, as I've talked about, what we're trying to do with our tools is do a lot of that heavy lifting for you with like crafting the prompt behind the scenes. Um, yeah, for me, I think this depends how difficult it turns out to actually develop prompt engineering as a skill and see that as a separate skill to coding itself. Actually, uh, I know that we have uh, a couple of projects in the data art related to the prompt engineering. So I know that mm. it is not so easy as many can think about it. Dima, is it right? Yes, yes, exactly. And actually, we are trying to make the prompt engineering the required skills for a senior plus people. So mm. everyone knows the prompt examples, how to use them for their job, for their productivity. And I, I agree with uh, Jody. So probably it's not the question which will be asked on the interview. But if mm. you are in the team which uses Copilot and you don't know how to use that, that would be strange, you know. And it can be any type of Copilot, basically. It can be, you know, even local large language model without internet connection. But if people know how to boost their productivity and you do not, you will lose in, in your, your skills and again uh, different uh, capabilities so I, I think that that's where it's important to be aware of it at least and uh, keep track of the updates uh, I'm sure everyone will have the, their boost very soon if they didn't have yet <laughs> Good point, good point. Uh, okay, we already discussed about uh, uh, about migration from one language, let's say, to another one. But let's make a step back. Um, a, a lot of years ago, uh, I had uh, a project uh, that was related uh, with moving from one version of Java to another one, and it was not so easy to do, let's say. What do you think, in next couple of years, will we have... Um, a feature that can move our code from one version to another without any headaches, difficulties, just with simple one click of the button. Um, Andy, do you have any ideas about this topic? So I think this goes back a little bit to, well, I should take a step back. So for right now, I think this goes back to what Jody had mentioned earlier, which is, you know, the data sets only go back so far. So if Java comes out with a new version tomorrow and you're looking to upgrade from the previous version to the new one the next day, it, that's, that's not going to happen right now because it doesn't have that type of context. Is that something that I think is valuable? Personally, I do think there is quite a bit of value when trying to ease you know, migration or upgrade processes. So I, I think that is something that um, could happen in the future. Okay, and uh, what's about uh, the time expectation, let's say? Uh, how much it will take to train the model to use a new version of Java, let's say? Mandy, that, what do you think? That's a good question, and I am not sure um, the answer to that one. Maybe approximately, I don't know, months, two months, yeah. three months. Yeah, I, I don't have a, a, an answer to how long it would take to train that type of model. Okay, I, okay. Uh, 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 but yeah, I yeah, Jody. Probably just jump in. I can't really give like a time estimate, but I would say so increasing evidence is coming out, you know, no big surprise here that very well crafted data can give you like a lot more performance out of these models. So I would say the trick there is probably sitting down and making a really well structured data set that reflects, you know, this latest framework. And that's probably where the time is going to be. Fine tuning itself is not actually that time consuming, but basically, you know, putting together the data is really what's going to be problematic there. Okay, okay, thank you for your thoughts. Uh, and maybe one of the general question about digital transformation process. So let's imagine we have a very, very legacy product and we want to digitally transform it into something new, something modern, and I don't know, use future technologies, modern technologies, uh, modern architecture, and so on. Will uh, AI tools help us here or not? What do you think about this? Mm. 
I would say in some aspects, yes, but I still think that there are going to be ambiguous soft decisions that need to be made. Like, so this comes back to the point that I made that a lot of the work with writing good applications is not about writing code. So I think it's going to require the experience of, say, senior engineers who can say, I know that that's not a good idea for this sort of use case to create this sort of application. You don't want to just replicate the same decisions that were made in the original architecture because it's not just that code moves on, it's that development practices move on. Okay, okay. Dima, Andy, do you agree with this? Or have yeah, yeah. Other yeah, I, opinion? I, I tend to agree. And uh, as, I, as I told before, the migration is a process of different people uh, doing different tasks. And uh, yeah, if you want to migrate monolith to monolith, probably it's not the best idea. But splitting to the microservices, it, it will require like much more knowledge than uh, just, you know, let's put into AI and ask to do it. Maybe not yet, but again, it's it's usually a process, the validation, the, the code quality, then CI, CD, then deployment, then testing manually, automation. So, uh, and even UI part, right? What would be the new okay. UI? This is the feature we cannot get like right now with text generation models. So still we need to re revise e even the models architecture and the e how AI working right now to do UI to UI migration. So this is maybe a future, but we're not there yet. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and to add a, a few more things, you know, what is the customer's needs are in the future, right? What, what, what are the, do you have SLAs? Do you have response time requirements? Do, you know, there's so many other scenarios to add in. Uh, if you're going to modernize an application, you might be changing it to a language. There's probably a, multiple languages you can actually choose. What if one is already well known within the organization compared to another one? You know, those are some decisions that AI may not be able to take into context right away. Okay, cool. So actually, uh, before we started, uh, one of our developers asked me to ask the question uh, for so, so uh, experienced people like you, uh, will the developer profession die in five years or not? So I think we already answered and yeah, uh, uh, Dima, you can uh, breathe uh, easily, everything will be fine. Dima, this is the name of the developer yeah. that asked me to ask this question, so yeah. Uh, okay. and. Uh, Maybe you can uh, you can provide some uh, I don't know general advice uh, for our developers for future what they should uh, learn about AI from what they should start to be uh, on strength. Um, Jody, can you start, please? Yeah. So maybe something that I want to kind of advise people to do is just mm -hmm. to learn a little bit about what the purpose of large language models were in the first place. They were designed to be general natural language processing machines. That is what they do. And I think we got so excited, we, we saw a lot of ourselves in these machines that we have overextended and personified them. And we try to apply them to use cases that they, they, just, they, they were never designed to do. So I think just learning a little bit about the basic background of how they originated, what they were originally designed for, can help you really understand how to get the best out of them. But I'm going to put on my psychologist hat here. That was my background, as I said. And I'm going to say also maybe just have a little bit of a read about the limitations of these models. And, you know, there's work by AI ethicists like Margaret Mitchell that you can follow up on. This will also help you get a sense of, you know, where you're going to overextend the model. And this for me, this is a very academic response maybe, but... Um, I think I've, I've done a lot of this work of explaining this context to developers and they said they found that really, really helpful in terms of understanding where to use these tools. Cool. Thank you for your pieces of advice. Andy, do you have uh, your own to share with us? Yeah. So we've mentioned it numerous times, right? The assistant and the co-pilot are, are such. You are still in the driver's seat. And because you are in the driver's seat, you have to be the one providing that context, that direction. So I like to tell people, you know, just like Jody mentioned, we need to understand the limitations. Mm -hmm. And the best way, in my opinion, you know, since we have these tools out here already, 
get your hands dirty, try them out a little bit, right? I show all the time, hey, I can I can do the same task multiple ways. And based on what I even tell it as a comment mm-hmm. or or you know, the the copilot starts moving in that direction. And sometimes if it's not the direction I want, I have to steer it back. So this isn't something that's just a a magic wand that will handle it all for you. You have to kind of massage it and and kind of you know steer it towards the right direction. And sometimes you have to change your prompts, change what you're doing to to really get the the results that you're looking for. And I, I find the best way to you know seeing it once is one thing, but get your hands dirty and try it out is another thing as well that I recommend. Thank you, Dima. What's about your pieces of advice? Yeah, I I think it's very important to find your use case where it really gives you the value. So that's towards uh, get your hands dirty, try something, uh, try how it works for you. Try to find your use case, do some prompt engineering, understand how it works. Try uh, different tools, try uh, different approaches. uh, And eventually, I I think that everyone can find this productivity boost for for yourself and uh, yeah, I, I think that's that's the main idea right now. So everyone will be on the same page how to use that. And this will give us to generate more code and then train bigger models, you know, and that's where we will be very soon. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone. And as a summary, I can say that it is very excited to be on this uh, step right now because I'm pretty sure that next couple of years we will have even further big steps uh, in AI tools and yeah, I'm okay that we will not develop a Skynet in the nearest future, but I want I want I want to have uh, let's say not just the copilot, but maybe also a driver like uh, me as a driver and copilot also as a driver who can help me with daily tasks. So guys, it was really interesting conversation. Uh, thank you speakers, thank you our viewers. This IT nonstop by Dataart and this Andrei Sidchuk. Stay tuned and see you later. 